Hello, Lonnie. Um, there's an old joke by Daniel Tosh, I believe, that says they say money can't buy happiness, but you don't see many frowns on a wave runner. That's a key joke for understanding my relationship to money. In 2011, two important things happened. The first was I got a job with a California tech company while living in the Midwest. I've always been terrible with money, never kept a budget, but suddenly rent got paid. Bills were taken care of. Debt started to go away. The second thing that happened in 2011 was the woman I was engaged to and had been with for six years left me. Breakups like that are weird. For the first month or so, I experienced a kind of euphoria. In a relationship where you've been making each other miserable for a fair amount of time, initially when you break up and you realize you don't have to deal with each other's crap anymore, you feel a sense of freedom you haven't felt in a long time. But at some point, it hits me that the the reason we made each other miserable for as long as we did was that we loved each other and didn't want to give up hope that we could work things out. I also didn't know it at the time, but I had been making a textbook mistake of making our relationship my entire life, my source of happiness and ultimate priorities. I thought I was committing. But really, I was just hiding out. In a long-term relationship like that, you develop this entire emotional tool set that is specific and unique to this one person. And when it's over, it's like this entire part of you has no purpose or place anymore. I discovered I didn't really know who I was, and slowly descended into a depression, the likes of which I had never experienced in my life. The I could get up, but why kind of depression. So there I was, lonely, single, and making too much money, slowly sinking into a bog of infinite sadness, and my mind would desperately grapple at the darkness for something to stop the descent. I started making terribly impulsive decisions that I would hide from myself by cloaking them with not unreasonable rationalizations. One of my go-tos was, I need to be productive, develop myself. Now that I was untethered from this relationship, I needed to build myself into this strong, independent, successful man. So, it would work kind of like this. I know I have a laptop for work and a desktop computer already, but if I had another laptop, then I could really get stuff done. No one needs three personal computers. I know I have an iPhone and a desktop and two laptops, but if I had an iPad, then I could really get stuff done. Nope. I know I haven't worked out in years, and abhor exercise in any form, and buy too many adult juice boxes, but... If I had a fitness watch, then I'd really get stuff done. What I would notice after buying all of this crap is there would be an initial glow of happiness that would last a couple of days, sometimes a week. But generally, after the seventh day, I would find myself back where I was, and with a new electronic piece of junk sitting in the corner that hardly got used. It wasn't working. I needed to escalate the stupid. So, I took my midlife crisis west, making an important alteration to my financial picture that I didn't make note of at the time. I was now making a California salary, not paying California levels of expenses, San Francisco level of living expenses. That's Tesseract levels of living expenses, where you can see all living expenses at the same time. Murf! And it probably took about six months before I started to realize this wasn't working. I was living in the sunset, which is essentially the Mordor of San Francisco, working from home, and one day, as the quicksand started to pull me further down, I thought, man, this rent is expensive. And I've been depressed for so long, I'm starting to wonder if I'll ever get to be happy again. Maybe, maybe what I need is a hobby. I should buy a boat. <coughs> now, Remember, terrible impulsive decisions needed to be wrapped up in good ones. I thought, it will get me out of the apartment. I'll learn a masculine trade. This was particularly attractive to me. I've never been a mechanically minded, uh, macho masculine kind of guy, and especially when I was going through being curl up in the ball on the floor and cry type of guy, macho had an appeal. I thought, I'll learn to take care of the boat and paint it and fix the engine. And finally, 
This was my biggest justification. I thought, I'll live on it. A slip fee at a marina is like 600 bucks a month. I was paying two grand for 700 square feet in San Francisco. So after taking one sailing class where I hit my head on the boom and almost fell in the water twice, I bought a 28-foot Catalina for $2,000 from a professional boat salesman named Herb. The boat needed some work, so Herb pointed me to a good shippy boat repair type place, and I took it over and said, just fix everything. I want it all ship shape in Bristol, you know. A month later, I get a call from the boat canic, and they said, well, we got everything taken care of and ready the way you asked. That'll be $22,000. <gasps> you would think this might have induced what we call a moment of clarity, but you'd be wrong. One shady and aggressive online loan later, I showed up at the boatsy repairy place and took the boat for its inaugural run from the yard to the marina I could afford in South San Francisco, where I immediately grounded it on a sandbar at low tide. After a couple of kindly gentlemen in a powerboat pulled me out, I began to move my stuff on board, starting with my cat, Harley. First thing she did when I brought her aboard was crawl into a bed at the bow of the ship, point her face into a corner, and refused to look at me, as if to say, what the hell are you doing to us, man? I started to meet the other people living aboard their ships at the marina. These were the masculine, macho, manly men that I was aspiring to be. Men who could fix their engines at night with a band-aid and a can of silly string or, you know, tools. A few days later, I was paying my slip fee to the harbor master and asked him, how many people are living aboard here? And he told me that California actually had a law that marinas could only rent 10% of their slips to live aboards. If you weren't one of those, you were only allowed to spend three nights a week at a marina. And in the Bay Area, he said, there were waiting lists to become a live aboard that were seven to 10 years long. But if I wanted to, I could stay in the marina three nights a week and then take the boat out and just go and drop anchor. But I, I hadn't taken the course on how to drop anchor yet. And remember, right now, I'm making a monthly San Francisco rent, a boat slip fee, and a monthly payment at PredatoryLoans.com. I had pulled off something pretty remarkable, really. Yeah, I had officially managed to duplicate my own emotional descent in my finances. A couple of days later, my dad and sister were visiting, and they both wanted to see the boat and go out on the water. It seemed a little windy. The flag was waving, but emotionally, I think I was trying to salvage this debacle, and impressing my dad with my new sailboat felt like steps in the right direction. So we motored out onto the water and put the sails up, which I remembered how to do. I noticed that both my dad and my sister were looking to me for how things worked and what they should be doing, which made me realize I had no idea. And I started to notice we were going over these huge waves. I thought, oh, the, the ocean's pretty terrifying. Maybe they were like this, but in my mind, I'm clinging onto the safety lines around the boat and seeing sharks in my head as I'm tossed over. I look down in the cabin and Harley's gripping onto the bench, yowling as we go over each wave. And on the floor, sloshing back and forth is about six inches of water. And I realize everything I own is on this boat. 50% of my entire family is on this boat. If this thing sinks and gets us all killed, there's barely a record of my existence in the world. My sister, who was relaxing on the front of the ship, thinking everything was okay, looked over at me, and I must have been more pasty white than usual because she said, are you okay? And like a nightmare where you can't scream, I could only stammer, I'm scared. Right then, thanks to my own pulsating fear of death and the ocean, I had a moment of clarity. I've made a huge mistake. We got back to the marina, and as I'm tying up, one of the manly, macho, masculine men came up, and I told him we were just out on the water, and he said, are you crazy? Winds like this? That's dangerous, man. Did you see the flag? And that was it. A week later, I called up Herb and asked if he could sell the boat for me. We managed to get $6,000 for it. Unable to make my rent and my monthly payment to predatoryloans.com, I decided to move back to Colorado where I did the thing I probably should have done in the first place and got myself into therapy. When you finally do a study of yourself and all the ways you interact with the world, healthy and unhealthy, it's an eye-opening experience. I learned a number of things in rapid succession. First, you can't clean the slate by moving 
when you are the slate. My misery wasn't around me on the street corner where she and I had coffee or in our favorite Italian restaurant. It was inside of me. I couldn't escape that by a move or a new hobby or a new laptop. I needed to confront it. Second, when you're trying to figure out who you are and what you're passionate about, a certain amount of throwing shit against the wall to see what sticks is necessary. I'm not embarrassed about having tried these things out. I'm actually not embarrassed about any of this. All I'm saying is try to be honest about your own motivations. When I look closely at what attracted me about the boat, it wasn't learning a craft or because I like boats. I hate the ocean. It was another form of hiding out. If all else fails, I could have just sailed away. Now that I've been through this experience, whenever I'm on the cusp of making a big purchase, my closest friends who all know me and know what I've been through ask, is it a boat? Which is code for? Is this an impulsive, expensive fix for some fear or existential crisis that you should be addressing with maybe some sit-ups or a cooking class? At one point, while talking to the therapist, I started describing my parents' divorce. I was 11 and my mom took it very hard. When I was over at her place, she was always sad and there were always storm clouds. But when I was at my dad's, things were fun. During the divorce, he bought a new Forerunner and a Nissan Z and a new condo, camera equipment, a new computer, all these toys. It was so fun. Huh. He's 72 this year, and I went to visit him a few weeks ago, told him this story, and said, that was a hell of a midlife crisis you had, Dad. That was pretty good. And he put a hand on my shoulder and said, well, it was. But if there's one thing I've always tried to teach you, it's never half-ass. See you in two weeks, Lonnie.